Well, we concluded our Amos study last time at um, chapter 3, verse 13. They're using the typical biblical metaphor of God behaving as a fierce lion. Amos explained how the wealthy and the elite of Samaria, the capital city of the, the northern kingdom of Ephraim, Israel, how they would be judged for their arrogance, for their maltreatment of the poor and the common folk among their nation. Now, although it may seem strange for Christians to hear, it bears notice that the way this act of God is framed is as a legal argument. And since Amos was a sheep breeder, then he explains the legality of God doing what he's about to do from the standpoint of the duties and the responsibilities of a shepherd. Now it's important to keep in mind that all throughout Amos, just as it was in Hosea, that the justice Yehovah is administering to various people and nations is according to that which is set down in the covenant of Moses. Just as Israel is expected to follow the terms of that covenant, so God obligates Himself to do the same. The Father is not a hypocrite. The legal basis comes from the Torah instruction that a shepherd is legally responsible for the well-being of the sheep that are put under his care. And shepherds only sometimes owned the sheep they tended. More often they were hirelings that worked for the sheep owner. Now, should he carelessly lose a sheep, he is responsible to pay the sheep owner for the loss. However, if a wild animal kills a sheep, he's not. Even so, evidence that a wild animal was the culprit in the loss is necessary. It's necessary in the form of presenting the remains of that sheep, however meager, <laughs> to the owner. Exodus 22, verses 9 through 12. If a person trusts a neighbor to look after a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal, and it dies, is injured, or is driven away unseen, then the neighbor's oath before Adonai that he has not taken the goods will settle the matter between them. The owner is to accept it without the neighbor making restitution. But if it was stolen from the neighbor, he must make restitution to the owner. If it was torn to pieces by an animal, the neighbor must bring it as evidence, and then he doesn't need to make good the loss. See, this is why those specific details in this passage in Amos of a, a bit of bone in an ear being all that is left, that's why it's provided in this passage of Amos. This is the required evidence that it is not the fault of the shepherd who, in this metaphor, is also God. It's not his fault that the sheep was lost. So to be clear, God is pictured as switching roles from being the sheep, the shepherd protector, if you would, over Israel, to being the lion that hunts them down and tears them apart and devours them. God is absolving himself for the responsibility of the destruction of the wealthy of Ephraim, Israel, especially since he's the one doing all the destroying. All legal requirements as set down in the Torah, they're being met. Now, so that we maintain proper context, let's back up to verse 12, and let's read from there through the end of chapter 3. Open your Bibles to Amos chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 12. Amos chapter 3, starting at verse 12. As a shepherd, uh, this is what Adonai says, as a shepherd rescues from the mouth of a lion, 
a couple of leg bones or a piece of an ear. So the people of Israel in Shomron, that's Samaria, will be rescued, huddled under cushions in the corners of their beds. Hear and testify against the house of Yaakov, against Jacob, says Adonai Elohim Elohei Zevaot. For when I punish Israel's crimes, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. I will tear down winter houses as well as summer houses. Houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed. The mansions will be no more, says Adonai. Now, towards the end of verse 13, we read, Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says Adonai Yehovah Elohim of the hosts. Now, I, I, I've mixed the original Hebrew with the English so that you get a better sense of what is literally stated. Yehovah continues to identify himself by name. Yehovah. Yudhe as Israel's God, and as also God over the hosts of heaven, meaning God's angelic or uh, divine army. Now, who exactly is God calling upon to hear and to testify against the house of Jacob? First, it is not entirely clear whether in this case, house of Jacob means all twelve tribes, as it usually does, or if it is only aimed at the ten tribes of Ephraim Israel. I believe in this rare case the context demands that God is meaning those ten tribes does not also include the two tribes of Judah. Now as for who the listeners to this oracle are, who are there to be? The phrase is more just a literary formula or a, a figure of speech. It's a figure of speech of a forceful demand that all who hear this message are to pay close attention. And what follows in verses 14 and 15, as well as the first verses of chapter 4, is what the wealthy and the elite of Israel need to understand is happening to them and why it's happening. At this point, the focus of social injustices changes to the severe faults in their worship practices and rituals. God says He will punish the altars of Bethel, which will include cutting off the horns of the altar. Altars in God's Torah serve two functions. First, as a place of ritual sacrifice to Jehovah, and second, interestingly, as a place of asylum. Exodus 21, verses 12-14, through 14, Whoever attacks a person and causes his death must be put to death. If it was not premeditated but an act of God, then I will designate for you a place to which he can flee. But if someone willfully kills another after deliberate planning, you are to take him even from my altar and put him to death. So in addition to the six planned cities of refuge in the land that a, a person might flee to for protection from an aggrieved next of kin, a person in danger of being killed for accidentally or unintentionally killing another may also run to the altar and grab hold of it. There was a specific way a person was to grab hold of the altar so as not to defile it. 1 Kings uh, chapter 1, verses 49 through 51. All this at Adonia's guests grew frightened. They got up, everyone going his own way, and Adonia too was afraid because of Shlomo, because of Solomon. He got up, he went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Shlomo was told, Here, Adonia is terrified of King Shlomo. He has grabbed hold of the horns of the altar and is saying, First, let King Shlomo swear to me 
that he will not have his servant executed. So, altars had protrusions on each of its four corners called horns. And those horns of the altar were what a person fearful for his life was to grab hold of. So in Amos 13, four, uh, rather Amos 3, 14, God is saying that the altar in Bethel will no longer be a place of asylum. Thus an end of the altar means that the people will have no place to expiate their sins, nor will they have a place to run to for immunity from prosecution. In truth, while apparently in Ephraim, Israel, that tradition of the altar of the place of asylum and sacrifice was in practice, Jehovah didn't recognize it as valid to Him. Why? Because of its location. See, here the place of the altar is said to be Bethel. Bethel is not a legitimate location for an altar to Jehovah. The punishment for violating this Torah law is found in Leviticus 26. In Leviticus 26, verses 30 and 31, I will destroy your high places. I will cut down your pillars for sun worship and throw your carcasses on the carcasses of your idols, and I will detest you. I will lay waste to your cities and make your sanctuaries desolate so as not to smell your fragrant aromas." Now hopefully, by now, it's really starting to resonate with you how God precisely follows the law He gave to Moses for determining both crime and the punishment for each crime. Now remember this, because as we watch the world around us today, rapidly decaying into rampant immorality and sin. Just refer to the Law of Moses to see exactly what God is going to do as His punishment. He doesn't deviate from it. It's there for all to see. But because the church long ago decided to ignore the Law of Moses, even declaring it faulty and bad, this resource is not used because it's not believed. My advice? Start believing it. And start paying attention to it. Now notice how God says, for when I punish Israel's crimes. This means the punishment is not immediate, but rather is at an unspecified future time. What has been going on is that for decades and decades, Ephraim, Israel's sins and apostasies have been piling up. There hasn't been just a single event or two that caused God's judgment to fall. And practically speaking, it also means that the people who are alive and will be affected by these punishments and curses may not be the ones who committed some of the offenses. For many of the sins will have occurred in the past, and thus some of the sinners are going to be long dead and gone. See, this pattern of God delaying punishment of a, of a generation, then punishing a current generation, not only for their own sins, but also for those of a previous generation, when those sins of that previous generation were not punished, is called vertical retribution. It's a rather common understanding in many religions of the ancient Near East. It can be read about in Exodus, Leviticus, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, and more books of the Bible. So it's actually quite a standard biblical topic and principle. Verse 15 includes, as part of the future punishments, the opulent homes of the wealthy aristocrats of Samaria. All the decadent pleasures the rich enjoy with their multiple residents, parties, sex orgies, 
drunkenness and more are going to come to an end. The mention of ivory houses doesn't mean the house was made out of ivory. Rather, it speaks of decorations and furnishings of enormously expensive and ornate items made of ivory. Now, a valuable lesson to be learned to those who are in power, for those who have amassed enormous wealth, is that sooner or later it's all going to be brought to nothing. The corruption that has gone on in the highest government echelons will be dealt with by the Father. And a simple mea culpa and apology is not going to do. Let's move on to chapter 4. Open your Bibles to Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. Let's, we're going to read it all together. All right, Amos chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Listen, you lovely cows of Bashan who live on Mount Shomron, Samaria, who oppress the poor and grind down the needy, who say to their husbands, Bring me something to drink. Adonai Elohim has sworn by His holiness that your time is surely coming. You will be dragged away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will leave through breaks in the wall, each woman right behind the next, and be sent off to Harmonah, says Adonai. Come to Badel and commit crimes. To Gilgal, commit more crimes. Bring your sacrifices in the morning and your tithes after three days. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering. Brag in public about your voluntary offerings, because that's what you love to do. Don't you, Israel? Says Adonai. I made your teeth clean of food in all your cities. Left you nothing to eat in all your villages. Still, you haven't returned to me. Says Adonai. I withheld the rain from you three months before the harvest. I made it rain on one city, not on another. One field had rain, while another had with no rain dried up. From two or three cities, they would stagger to one city for water to drink, but there wasn't enough. Still, you haven't returned to me, says Adonai. I struck your crops with hot winds and blight, your many gardens and vineyards, the cutter worms devoured your, your fig and olive trees. Still, you haven't returned to me, says Adonai. I sent a plague on you, like that of Egypt. Put your young men to death with the sword. Let your horses be captured. Filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. Still, you haven't returned to me, says Adonai. I overthrew some of you, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Still, you haven't returned to me, says Adonai. This is why I will deal with you in this way, Israel. And because I will deal with you in this way, prepare to meet your God, Israel. Him who forms mountains, creates wind, who declares to humankind his thoughts, who turns the morning to darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. Adonai Elohei Zevaot is his name. Well, Yehovah's diatribe against the unconscionable behavior of the wealthy continues with his disdain of high society women. Beginning with the phrase, hear this word. God returns to issues of social injustices. The Cows of Bashan is a rather sarcastic title that refers to the rich society women of the Northern Kingdom. Now, these women are disrespectful to their husbands, demanding that their husbands serve them something to drink. And constantly they demand their spouses to give them everything their hearts desire. Often these selfish desires lead to driving poor people even further into poverty. These cows of Bashan are named as the number one culprit behind the exploitation of the poor and the defenseless. So, in essence, these women were entitled, completely self-centered, self-concerned, 
and they made life hard on those they lorded over, house servants and the like, and those who should have lorded over them, their overly indulgent husbands. You know, Bashan was an amazingly fertile place that was located on the west side of the Jordan River. Now, it was famous for its abundant pasture lands. And as a result of the availability of a large food supply, the beauty and size of their cattle. So, the cows of Bashan, epithet, God bestows upon these arrogant and domineering women of Samaria. Now, in swearing by his own holiness, Yehovah in verse 2 vows to do to these women exactly what he says he's going to do. It will not be retracted, and it is in, as inevitable as the sun coming up in the morning. They will eventually come to ruin and reap their just reward for their irresponsibility and their haughtiness. Now, I spent much time speaking to men about our responsibilities to our families, to our God, responsibilities that much too often we either ignore or we give it to our wives, or at times allow our willing wives to bear it. Here then I suppose I ought to pause and speak for a few minutes to the women. About your responsibilities to your families to God. I'm not going to do all that right now. That said, I do want to caution the self indulgences and demands placed on husbands to provide the material pleasures and privileges that you may seek, or for you to demand to control. Some responsibilities that are in God's economy, that in God's economy fall within the roles of males. This is what Adam is talking, uh, rather, Amos is talking about right now, and that God is condemning. Now, just as not all women of Samaria behaved in that way, many did. It had clearly become a cultural norm for Israel's upper class, so it never occurred to many of these women they were doing anything wrong. Probably many, likely most, of the women listening to this are not of this ilk, like those cows of Bashan. But for those of you who might be, or suspect you might be, take notice of how God looks upon you. This is not trivial. It's not going to be forgotten. Divine justice will inevitably come upon you, even though our Western society may well applaud you for it. And the consequences are probably going to be un unimaginably awful. So do the simple but not necessarily easy thing that these Sumerian women did not. Humble yourselves. No matter how able you are, humble yourselves before God. No matter how beautiful you are, humble yourselves before your husbands. No matter how well off or in charge you are, humble yourselves to those who may serve you. Just as those haughty angels rebelled and they left their sphere in heaven, crossing over a boundary that was not to be crossed, and they caved in to the temptations of women on earth, producing quasi humans called Nephilim, so it is for you to rebelliously leave your sphere and the accompanying roles of God as godly wives, and then to inject yourself into a different sphere and take on accompanying roles that God has set apart for husbands. Okay, what is it? What is this in verse 2 then? About these women being dragged away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. Well, the truth of it is that these words have always caused 
Bible translators' problems, so various solutions have been offered. Now, we're not going to go through all the list of possibilities, but here's what I think is maybe the best attempt to translate it in a way that we can actually extract the intended meaning. Shalom M. Paul writes it this way, When you shall be transported in baskets, and the very last one of you in fishermen's pots. Now, very likely, the image that Amos was trying to capture, which I suspect his ancient readers would have readily understood, is the way fish were typically caught, packed, and then shipped in such vessels as baskets and pots. Various ancient sources speak of recently caught fish being packed layer by layer in baskets and in pots. There is some evidence that when it was freshwater fish that was being shipped, it was done in woven baskets, while for saltwater fish transportation, that was accomplished in clay pots. And it was also a common metaphor in the ancient Near and Middle East to speak of captives in terms of fish being caught in the net. So the overall idea was that these grand women of Samaria, with their glorious homes, all their privilege and wealth, would be reduced to being captured and then transported elsewhere in the same manner as dead fish were. The ultimate humiliation for them. Verse 3 prophesies that the city walls of Samaria will have been breached by the invading enemy in so many places that one could quite literally walk into or out of the city by simply walking straight ahead from wherever they might have been standing at the time. We see this same scenario in play when Joshua led the Israelites to attack Jericho, and its walls were so thoroughly destroyed in Joshua 6.5. Then they are to blow a long blast on the shofar, and on hearing the sound of the shofar, all the people are to shout as loudly as they can, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. Then the people are to go up into the city, each one straight from where he stands. Well, now verses 2 and 3 work together to explain that the invaders of Samaria will have no trouble winning their battle against Israel, accessing and ransacking the city, or in capturing its residents. However, the statement that the women will be sent off to Harmonah is puzzling. No one has a good viable guess as to where this place was located. Now, it is possible that the word Harmonah is actually Hermon, like Mount Hermon. But that's just speculation, one of several other speculations. Well, in the end, the last few verses of chapter 3, along with the first three verses of chapter 4, are depicting an abrupt, a, a polar opposite change of circumstance for the women of the elite class of Samaria. Overnight, they go from wealthy and privileged to utterly ruined and penniless. Many will be killed, many captured, many unceremoniously transported to faraway places. All will be reduced to the same status as the servants and the poor that they had oppressed for all those years. Well, verse 4 begins a new section of Amos. And it seems to be directed towards the people of Ephraim, Israel in general, and it begins with some obvious sarcasm. The people of Ephraim, Israel are invited to come to Bethel and to Gilgal in order to continue in their ritual transgressions by illegally worshiping and sacrificing at that unauthorized place. There seems to have been three major worship sites in Ephraim, Israel. Bethel, Gilgal, and Dan, all founded by King Jeroboam. So why Dan isn't mentioned, I don't know. Interestingly, there was a time in Israel's past when Bethel and Gilgal had been legitimately used 
to worship God. All at a time before the temple had been built by kings David and Solomon. The problem is that after united Israel split into two separate kingdoms, King Jeroboam had, for political reasons, led his priests to create temples for his people in the northern kingdom to worship at in order to directly compete against the temple in Jerusalem of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, it is probably meant almost comically when the people of Israel are invited to come to Bethel and commit crimes, come to Gilgal, commit some more. In other words, from Jehovah's perspective, to even go to Bethel and Gilgal counts as sin against him. No matter how sincere in intentions the people doing this might have been. And since Amos, remember, Amos was a resident of Judah, is speaking against the religion and the religious organization that the residents of Ephraim Israel were practicing, one has to ask just what the relationship between prophets and priests was at that time. That is, were God's prophets and God's priests enemies of one another? Let's step back for a moment and examine this important matter that flavors that flavors all of what Amos wrote. Now, interestingly, up until not terribly long ago, most Bible historians and translators believed that the prophets and the priests were unfriendly rivals. And so there was continuing animosity of not outright dislike between the two groups since it seems the prophets regularly attacked what they saw as wrong actions of the priesthood, so naturally the priest didn't like those attacks. On the other hand, more recent Bible scholarship has pointed out, correctly I believe, that just as later in time, perhaps 500 years or more, when the synagogue was born as a separate organization from the priesthood, there didn't seem to be that much open antagonism between prophets and priests, even if the relationship wasn't entirely comfortable. Each group, provided they stayed within their agreed sphere of responsibility, had their roles to play in the practice of the Hebrew faith. Even so, it also appears that on balance, the prophets could be characterized as the theological innovators of the Bible era, while the priests were the guardians of the religious status quo. So, there had to be some friction, erupt at times, between priest and prophet, although the degree of it ought not to be blown out of proportion. Further, while the priest while the priest stressed the doing of ritual, doing the ritual procedures properly, The prophets tended to focus on the general moral and ethical nature of people's lives and actions. Now, perhaps we could oversimplify it a little bit and call it a a strict rules following versus the condition of the heart is the emphasis. That is, from the view of the prophets, proper obedience to God begins with the right heart attitude and inner condition, not the other way around. On the other hand, the priest tended to stress proper righteousness righteousness in terms of following the written code of the Torah as perfectly as possible. Now, biblically speaking, they were both correct. While the prophets emphasized being completely devoted to Jehovah, the priests emphasized doing the scripturally required ritual devotions correctly. In the end, it was not an issue of either or, but rather an issue of difference in priority. Now, God expects our devotion, but at the same time, He expects our obedience to Him through the devotions of our Torah based worship requirements and restrictions. It's a balance. It's a balance. It's a balance that is to be achieved in God's worshipers, and one that Christians and Jews have had the hardest time finding and maintaining. 
And I'm telling you this because what we don't want to do is to characterize Amos as a religious reformer whose goal was to react negatively and work against the concept of a temple and a priesthood. There are a number of modern-day Bible scholars who are currently attempting to construct a new and different picture of Amos as a prophet that railed on God's behalf against the entire concept of Israel even having a temple or a priesthood or ritual worship practices, and I want to make it clear that this is in no way the case. That's not what's happening here. The reality for Amos was that there were two separate Israelite priesthoods existing in his time. There was the legitimate one in Judah, practicing at the temple in Jerusalem, and there was the illegitimate one in Ephraim, Israel, practicing at the several temples as such places as Bethel and Gilgal and Dan. The issue of what was going on with the legitimate priesthood in Jerusalem is not particularly pertinent to the bulk of the book of Amos. Rather, the issue primarily concerned Ephraim Israel's illegitimate priesthood that had seriously gone off track by thinking immorally and unethically, which led them to doing improper ritual, beginning with erecting bogus altars wherever they pleased, establishing illegitimate temples according to their own thoughts and pleasures, and then compromising the Law of Moses by means of adopting and blending some of the worship practices of the local pagan religions with what was instructed in the Law of Moses. Both priesthoods claimed all along to be worshiping Jehovah, God of Israel, but the worship of the Ephraim Israelite priesthood clearly wasn't compatible with what God demanded in the Torah. Therefore, for a priest, or for a common person, to perform even a legitimate Torah-based ritual act, but whose heart was corrupted, was deemed by Amos as not acceptable to Jehovah. So indeed, we will soon find Amos clashing with the illegitimate priests of Ephraim Israel, not so much with the priests of Judah. Verse 4 continues with, Bring your sacrifices in the morning and your tithes after three days. Burn leavened bread as a thanks offering. Brag, uh, brag in public about your voluntary offerings, because that's what you love to do, don't you, Israel? Says Adonai. Elohim. So here we have God mocking Israel sarcastically telling Israel, you know, go right ahead. Continue to do your rituals. They felt so very good about. Bring their sacrifices to the altars in the morning. Bring their tithes to the temples. Burn up bread with leaven as part of the thanks offering, but then go off and brag to everybody about your great piousness and giving more offerings that are required. Because, from Jehovah's perspective, they're doing all this in vain anyway. Now, ironically, as intensely religious as these people were, they were only intensely increasing their sin. They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. I'm going to say this another way. Amos reveals Israel's true love. But it is not about loving God with all of their strength or loving their neighbor as themselves. Rather, they are showing love, allegiance, to a man-made system of religion that actually, in the end, goes against the system that God gave to them on Mount Sinai. From Amos's prophet viewpoint, no amount of ritual can ever replace correct moral and ethical thought and behavior. And illegitimate ritual makes that attempt to do so even more ludicrous and sinful. 
So starting in verse 6 is a series of punishments that God inflicted on Israel in hopes that the people would recognize that what they were doing was wrong. They would repent. They would return to the lovely ways of Jehovah as expressed in the Torah. Israel, because of their close ties and friendships with pagans, had come to expect the God of Israel to behave the same way as Baal gods did. In exchange for their devotion to their religious rituals, they expected God to provide blessings of fertility, protection, and abundance. Now, I've mentioned it a few times. It was their version of the modern Christian notion of a prosperity doctrine, whereby the more faithful we seem to be, the more material wealth God is obligated to give to us. Therefore, our level of wealth is the outward indicator of our faithfulness to God. So the Israelites were shocked when despite their passionate devotion to their religious rituals, their lives and their nation were falling apart. In verse 6, God says that He made their teeth clean of food. This was an ancient idiom. It meant they had no food. So one's teeth were clean because they hadn't chewed any food. See, this is speaking of severe food shortages in Israel's cities and villages that God says He caused to happen. This and all the other punishments God is speaking of to close out chapter 4 are things that happened in Israel's past. But rather than the people who experienced these events seeing them for what they were, heavenly discipline to get them to pay attention and return to God, they ignored it. They blamed it on things like weather or enemies, you know, things like climate change. Five times we will see the words, yet you did not return to me. Israel has not learned their lesson, nor did they change their ways. Well, the next curse God inflicted upon Israel was drought. Verse 7, God says that for three months leading up to the harvest, He withheld rain. The harvest season begins with barley, and then a few weeks later, wheat. Because the critical time for sufficient watering of the fields was the weeks leading up to harvest, then due to the, to the lack of rain, the crop yields were small, causing great hardship on the public. But even more, God inflicted frustration on the people because it seemed that one field would get rain, one nearby wouldn't. One city would get rain, Another city nearby wouldn't. It made no sense. Again, the people just cursed their bad luck. And they ignored Jehovah's purpose to get them to see their wrong behaviors and return to Him. Verse 8 explains that the lack of rain didn't just impact the grain harvest. It also caused cisterns and wells to run dry of their drinking water. The mention of the city people staggering. Staggering around is about the effects of dehydration, like we see in Hollywood movies of thirsty people stranded in the desert, walking erratically, about to collapse. And take notice of the use of the numbers 2 and 3. The verse says, from two or three cities they would stagger. See, this is another, another case of what is called staircase numerical parallelism. Recall in a previous lesson that I explained the use of the numbers 3 and 4 together. They were meant to symbolize everything, everywhere, all-inclusive. But 2 and 3 used together are a way of symbolizing a few or several. 
perhaps even a kind of a randomness. So we are not to understand this literally as if there were only two or three cities in all of Ephraim, Israel, that experienced this severe lack of drinking water. Rather, it means at various places around their kingdom this occurred. Now, verse 9 is yet another attempt by God to get Israel to repent. He sent diseases and pestilence upon their food crops. And this is, once again, a direct consequence for their sin, as listed in the Torah, Deuteronomy 28, 22. God will strike you down with wasting diseases, fever, inflammation, fiery heat, drought, blasting winds and mildew, and they will pursue you until you perish. Now, hot winds are nothing new to arid regions. They go by various names. In the Middle East, they were known as uh, Sirocco. Another name was Hamsim. And because of their extreme dryness, wind speed and high temperatures, these winds could quickly just kind of kind of suck all the moisture from plants and trees, leaving them either barren of leaves and fruit or damaged to the point where they just died. Insects were also sent to devour Israel's, Israel's orchards and their vegetable gardens. Most English Bibles use the words like cutterworm or palmer worm or even caterpillar to describe these insects. The Hebrew word is gazam, and the better translation is simply locusts. In verse 10, a memory of the plagues of Egypt is evoked, and it is linked to war. These, of course, are among the many curses for disobedience as stated in the Law of Moses. Israel's best troops would be killed by the sword. Even the best military weapon of the era, horse and chariot, were captured by the enemy. Now, although it's a bit vague as to the meaning of the term, the idea of the stench of the army's camps, this most likely refers to the rotting corpses of soldiers. Now, in verse 11, much as God is trying to bring to mind the horrid conditions of Egypt and what He did to the Egyptian people in order to redeem Israel from them, now He reminds them of the horrors of what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, probably for the Hebrews, the most radical and severe of all the historical destructions that God visited upon earth was to the cities of the plains, as we read in Genesis 19. And despite God's wrath on Israel, where many perished, still, like rescuing, as it uses the term, a burning stick from a fire in order that it wouldn't be entirely consumed. God had mercy, and He didn't entirely destroy Israel despite their deserving it. And still, stubborn Israel wouldn't give glory and credit to God and return to Him. Now, these listings of punishment, punishments that God has inflicted in the past, building in intensity, building to in ferocity to a crescendo. This is now used in verse 12 as examples of what he is about to visit upon Ephraim, Israel, and soon. Nothing God had tried produced any meaningful repentance. Certainly the people would have prayed more, and maybe they would have sacrificed more, or they would have given more to the priests and to the temple, but always their actions were illegitimate. Therefore, it was worthless to Jehovah. What is proposed is terrifying. Terrifying. Partly because the event itself isn't fully disclosed, but nothing that God has used to try and produce repentance, things of nature. Now He's going to take matters into His own hands, and He's going to deal directly with Israel. Now, whereas up to now, all of these afflictions were meant to result in repentance, the actions coming are meant to produce nothing but destruction. 
Repentance no more plays a role. The time and opportunity for Israel to repent is past. The door to deliverance is closed, tight shut. All that remains now is judgment. God will not stay His hand. The entire range of horrors that He is able to inflict is going to come upon Israel, everywhere, all at once. Now let those with ears hear. Verse 13 is called by most Christian Bible commentators a doxology. Amos 4.13 says, says this, that ends the chapter. Him who forms mountains and creates wind, who declares to humankind his thoughts, who turns the morning to darkness and strides on the heights of the earth, Adonai Elohe Sebaot is his name. Now, naturally, among scholars, there is a debate as to whether this is original or it was added later. And equally naturally, there's really no way to prove this case either way. Rather, all depends on the opinions of these scholars and nothing else. The bottom line is that there's no basis whatsoever to claim this wasn't written originally by Amos. In fact, no version, no manuscript of Amos ever found excludes this doxology. In a nutshell, these final words tell Israel and us, tells us something we must always remember. God is in control of everything. He is able to, He has, and He will destroy the unfaithful at will. The entire creation, everywhere, at all times, reports to Him. And just so Ephraim Israel, who includes the worship of other gods and their re religious practices, understands who it is that is warning them about what is coming, the words, Yehovah, God of the heavenly armies, are used to make it abundantly clear. In saying that He declares to humankind His thoughts, it means He has given us various ways to know His will and His ways. From the natural law that He's infused into our very DNA, to the Law of Moses, in which He wrote down in an understandable, in an orderly way, His immutable definitions of morality and how we are to properly relate to Him and to our fellow man, we have no excuse to behave wrongly. None. We have no excuse to sin against Him. But more, there is going to come a reckoning. It will come, whether we believe it or we don't. And it will include everyone, everywhere, from every era and generation. Okay, we'll take up chapter 5 next time. Please join in with us today. Show your support and bless God's people by heading on over to holylandmarketplace.com. For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at torahclass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.